Hi, I'm Annie Fitzsimmons. I'm your Washington Realtors Legal Hotline lawyer. And this video is another in our series discussing stuff you have to do, so you might as well know how to do it well. And today's topic is timely presentation of offers. And I pause on both of those words because they both require some discussion. <laughs> Sabrina, how do you define timely? Oh, I'm sorry, Sabrina Joan Schroeder, Hi. educator, generally extraordinary human being out of Spokane. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for having me. How do you define timely presentation of offers? Um, well, as you said, you, you really have to break that out into two separate discussions. So um, when I'm when I'm teaching this topic, I um, I actually hit them in reverse. So let's talk about presentation first, okay. Annie. So what is um, because the agency laws, you have to timely present all written offers, notices, and communications to and from either party in a, in a, in a timely manner. So, so what is presentation? And let's use this in the context of a multiple offer situation. So I'm the listing broker, and let's say I've put the listing in the MLS on Thursday, and my seller says, you know, I'm not going to respond. And just as a little aside, um, little, little nuance here, I think it's a mistake uh, to to use the phrase the seller is not going to review offers uh, until Tuesday. If that's the approach you're going to take, uh, I would suggest the approach that your seller is going to be responding to offers on Tuesday because I think it's it's along with this discussion, it's your seller's obligation or and I think they're frankly going to want to review offers as they come in. So yeah. I prefer the term seller to respond to offers on Tuesday. So listing goes in Thursday. And um, let's say the seller says, I'm going out of town, I'm going to go play for the weekend, and I'll get together with you on Monday to review what's come in Monday evening and we'll respond on Tuesday. And frankly, I don't want to be bothered um, with anything over the weekend. And offers come in over the weekend. And let's say first offer comes in on Friday and the expiration date of that offer is Saturday night. Um, so we'll get to the timely part of that. Um, but, but first, what's the presentation of that offer? And, and so I'll ask in classes, is that, is that walking over to the seller's house and walking in the front door with that offer? Is that faxing it? Is it FedExing it? Is it emailing it? Um, and I think it's whatever your seller has told you how they want to receive that. Um, in this day and age, for the most part, it's probably emailing. So I, I think forwarding that full offer um, to the seller is probably going to be sufficient for presentation of that offer. But I do think it's the full offer. And I know there's some confusion about, is it presentation if I just list all of the offers on a spreadsheet, all the salient terms, and present just that spreadsheet? And in my opinion, that's not presenting the offer. I think it's emailing the entire offer. I, I agree with Sabrina with respect to presenting the entire offer, meaning you have to deliver the entirety of the offer. But I do think it's fine to help your, if you've got I mean, gosh, what's the, I've heard, I heard one seller received 125 offers or something like that on, on a listing. I mean, sometimes it's, it's incomprehensible that the seller is going to be able to review all the details of every single offer. So if you can make the information consumable, more consumable to a seller by helping them understand the information through some kind of a, a spread chart that shows information that's important to them, and don't assume that you know what's important to your seller but ask them what, which terms are important to them. Is it, is it price, is it closing date, earnest money, what are and are not contingencies, you know, whatever it might be, um, and then help them create a spread chart or something like that spreadsheet, a chart to understand um, the, the salient terms of each offer. That's okay, but Sabrina's oh, absolutely. absolutely right that you cannot replace delivery of the entire offer with that chart. You have to do both. That, that's what you're doing with them on Monday. And I, it, absolutely, I will, I will prepare that spreadsheet for my sellers. And that's what we're going over on Monday when we get together um, to look over those 5, 10, 120 um, offers is that spreadsheet where those terms are laid out. But prior to that, I have delivered into the seller's hands those offers via email. So, so to me, that is presentation. Now, timely, to me. But we went for the presentation. I just want to. I just want to say, um, don't you think that uh, you you touched on this? I just want to. I want to build on it a little bit more. Determining determining what's required for presentation requires that you know your client. Absolutely. Because if Sabrina were presenting, if I were her seller and she were presenting an offer to me, she could probably go into a little less detail than if I were, you know, an older person, maybe I didn't quite, I couldn't read the 
document quite as well. I had no familiarity. Maybe this is the first time I've ever sold real estate. Anything, maybe I'm a first time buyer. Whatever, whatever, wherever you find me as the broker, if I'm your client, you, you have to meet me there. Mm -hmm. And if I'm a sophisticated real estate investor, then you're gonna present offers to me one way. If I'm a first time home buyer, you're gonna present to me another way. If I'm a first time home seller, or maybe I've sold homes in the past, but it was a long time ago or whatever the circumstances may be. So be sensitive to the fact that you are the professional and it's up to you to meet your client where they are and to fulfill the needs that they have through the presentation style. It's never up to you how an offer is presented. It's up to the consumer, your client. Absolutely, advocate, right? How you are there representing your client and how do they want you to communicate with them? How how much hand-holding do they need ultimately? Right. right. Okay, timely. Timely. So back to my, my scenario, I put the offer in the MLS on Thursday. My seller said, I don't even want to meet with you until Monday. We'll respond to offers on Tuesday. Um, but an offer comes in on Friday and the expiration is Saturday. Uh, timely, in my mind, would certainly be getting that offer into the seller's hands before expiration. And I've had people say, but my seller told me that they didn't want to see those offers until Monday. Well, I defy you to tell me what seller does not want to see every offer that comes in on their property as, as soon as it comes in. Um, but, but regardless, timely presentation of that offer would be delivering in whatever means the seller and I have agreed that I will be delivering offers into their hands, very typically via email, prior to the expiration of that offer. If the seller chooses not to open the email and therefore not to respond to let that offer lapse, that is their decision. My agency law duty is simply to, to effect delivery timely. And from my perspective, that means prior to expiration of that offer. I'm often asked in classes, does timely delivery ever mean immediate? And yeah, I could envision a scenario where if I'm sitting down with that seller on Monday night and we're reviewing the 10 offers we've received and in walks offer number 11 and it's better than anything else, that could mean immediate uh, presentation of that offer. So, so timely could mean immediate, it could mean the next day, it, it depends on the circumstances. So you just made me think of a hotline question I got one time that it was a challenging question, challenging scenario for this broker and so I know you've never heard this scenario before, so I'm going to spring it on you. I'm, I'm, I'm sure you can handle the, the discussion, but, but let's, let's do this. It, it illustrates this notion of timely and immediate because sometimes timely might be, you know, again, depending on the seller's condition, it could be, it could be days out. Maybe the seller got into an auto accident and they're in the mm -hmm. hospital and you can't present to them. Mm -hmm. They don't have email. They're in a coma. You know, you can't present it to them even until after the offers have expired. Then, then timely is still whenever you can make the presentation to them. Or maybe it's this. Maybe I'm the listing broker and my seller has already countered an offer. Mm -hmm. So I've got a, a counter out there. And then I receive another offer as the listing broker, I receive another offer that is for better, higher price and better terms even than the counter offer that the seller extended. Mm -hmm. Sabrina, in that circumstance, when must I, what's my timeline for presenting this newly received offer to the seller? Well, that, that's another, in my mind, immediate presentation because it's, it's highly likely, um, let, let's just say my seller countered one of those 10 offers we were looking at, at, you know, $500,000 and, and the, the offer they countered was a 20% down conventional buyer. And while we're waiting for a response to that counter offer, we get an offer at 525 cash, close two weeks, and it's just the unicorn offer we were waiting on all weekend. Very likely the seller would like to withdraw the counter offer and go ahead and accept um, this 11th offer that came in. So presentation of offer number 11 in that scenario to me um, is immediate. So an immediate email, pick up the phone, call that seller immediately. This is what's come in. What do you think? Um, and then very carefully and very efficiently, quickly, nimbly um, withdraw the offer, which must be done in writing, form 36A withdrawal of offer or counter offer uh, before you move on. Uh, to accept offer number 11 because of course you don't want to put your sell seller in a situation where they've sold the house potentially twice. So Sabrina, when is the best time to have a Form 36A withdrawal of counteroffer signed by a seller? 
when the seller has signed a counteroffer. So what Sabrina just said, and, and I think she's brilliant, I think she's absolutely right about this. I learned this from Annie. That's, which is, of course, why I think she's brilliant. Uh, in a marketplace where sellers are likely to receive multiple, or at least we're hopeful that sellers are going to receive multiple offers, every time your seller signs a counter offer, have them sign a Form 36A withdrawal of counter offer. Why? Because then you can keep that withdrawal of offer in your briefcase or your electronic folder or wherever it is that you're going to keep it. You deliver the offer to the buyer's broker. But when offer number 11 comes in, that's at 525,000 cash deal closing in 20 days, two weeks. The, the now all you have to do is have a very quick phone call, text message. Mm -hmm. Maybe the, 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 I always use the example that the seller is now at their daughter's wedding and they cannot be interrupted, but they get their little text message that says, higher offer and all they have to do is send back a text message that says withdraw the offer now you have form 36a already signed by the seller and you can deliver it the question i invariably get when i'm teaching this is well, what date do we put on the 36a what Does if we don't matter. deliver the withdrawal of offer until two days after it's signed it doesn't matter mm -hmm. all that matters is the date of delivery not the date that it was signed and listing brokers please don't make this mistake please don't make the mistake picking up the phone and calling the buyer broker oh, to tell them that the seller will be withdrawing the offer. Because why, Sabrina, what's gonna happen as soon as you make that phone call? Been there, done that, got the t-shirt. Because they will immediately, especially if they already have it in hand and they just haven't quite gotten to the scanner yet, um, they will immediately forward the accepted counter offer. Um, this, I have literally been involved in more than one situation where it was a race to the scanner. This is less of an issue now with, with all of the electronic signing we're doing. Things can be done more quickly. We're not racing back to our office to scan and, and send paperwork back. But if you call the buyer's agent, number one, to, the first buyer's agent where you sent the counter to say, hey, I'm going to be sending, so sorry, going to be sending over a withdrawal of the counter offer, they're going to immediately race um, to send you the signed counter uh, set counter offer and you won't have the opportunity to accept offer number 11. So um, as hardcore as it sounds, your job in representing your client is to deliver effectively and timely as quickly as possible uh, the notices that they've instructed you to deliver. So you deliver the withdrawal of counter offer. You make sure you deliver it to both the buyer's agent and their firm. So you are not relying on the buyer's agent uh, confirming delivery of that email per um, the, the email uh, delivery provision in the purchase and sale agreement. Get it to them right away. And then as a courtesy, if you want to call uh, and, and you know, apologize and so sorry, it's, it's you know, hap happening this way, but always deliver first and call second yeah and then before we leave the the topic we we created this scenario where seller has an offer out and then they get this other offer in um in this hotline call that i got it was it was kind of it was i, I mean i'm just gonna tell you it was it was a sad phone call it, it was kind of heartbreaking to me because the broker the listing broker in this scenario was dealing with her own kind of family crisis medical emergency mm. when she got this 11th the, we're calling it the 11th offer this 11th offer in and she made a quick review of it to see that the terms were good she thought she needed to do some follow-up with the buyer broker who had submitted this offer but she knew it was a good offer and so she was dealing with her own issue at the moment so she set the offer aside mm. and then by the time several hours later she picked the offer up again of course by then the other buyer had accepted the seller's offer. And so when the listing broker shared all of this information with the seller, the seller became unhinged and was very unhappy, very unhappy with the listing broker. It's going not... to be a very expensive deposit into your real estate education fund that day. So, Sabrina, I'd, I'd love for you to touch on this, though. As a designated broker, managing broker, mm -hmm. what advice do you give brokers? Nobody knows when that situation is going to come up. Mm -hmm. Everybody has to have kind of a built-in buddy, right? A, a backup system. Yeah. Yeah, what absolutely. does that look like? You know, in, in, this, in this frenzied, high-paced market, this is why we get paid the big bucks, right? Um, this is, we work evenings, we work weekends, we work when it's not convenient, when we're supposed to be at our son's lacrosse game, but we need to be negotiating a transaction for our clients. If you are not going to be available to review an offer to do the work that needs to be done to service your your client 
then absolutely, you have got to find somebody in your office that can, uh, that can cover for you, that can, can do that work. It's, it's just too important. Um, we just have to advocate and take care of our clients. So um, if you are not going to make yourself available, and there, there are times when we're not going to be available, right. you just have to have somebody that's there, your buddy, uh, a colleague that's, that's got your six. Managing broker, anybody. I mean, whoever, Any, whoever it is. Whoever it is. Right? right? Yep. Okay. Before we leave off for presentation, we've talked about a whole bunch of stuff. There is one more thing, though, that we need to... Oh. Um, do offers only count if they come in at a time before the seller sold their property? I'm... I'm okay. I'm, I didn't explain that well. <laughs> seller's property may already be subject to a purchase and sale agreement, right? We may already have a binding purchase and sale agreement. Seller gets another offer. Still has to be presented. That's an offer that has to be presented. Mm -hmm. Seller might ha be looking for a buyer. Their, ha their property's not sold yet. It's listed at $100,000. They might get an offer for $28 written on a napkin. Still has to be presented. It's a written offer. Mm -hmm. It has to be presented. It might be the craziest offer on the planet. And you might be able to say in your own mind, there's no way on God's green earth seller's going to ever accept this offer. It still has to be presented. Seller might be able to negotiate with that buyer and get them up to an offer that the seller would accept. It might be a time where buyer and seller are already in a purchase and sale agreement and buyer's looking for a modification to the contract. Buyer makes an offer to the seller. It's a written offer. It has to be presented. Even if you know the seller's not going to change the closing date, buyers ask them to in a written offer to modify the purchase and sale agreement, you got to present it. Any written offer or other written communication Written offers, notices, and communications must be presented. Must be presented. With the key being that it's in writing. If, if a broker calls me, my seller's already under contract, they've accepted offer number 11, and a broker calls the next day and says, well, my offer, my buyer will offer $550,000 cash. That's a verbal offer. I, I'm not obligated to present that. But if they send it to me in writing, I absolutely have to present that. You just made me think of something that's so important about this topic before we leave. <laughs> Just one more thing. Buyer broker calls me and says, hey, you must not have presented my offer because my buyer offered more than, you know, they won't know until the transaction closes what the, what, what the sale price was. But how, Sabrina, do listing brokers 100% avoid mm -hmm. the disciplinary action over buyer broker's allegation that you failed to present their offer? Well, there's, there's only one way to do that, and I, I will tell you that other states are adopting legislation that requires this. And I think if we adopt this as an industry standard, we can avoid our legislature potentially adopting this as, as a legislative standard. And that is that you have your seller sign. Um, I will have, using my text tools, this is going to all be done electronically, just draw the red line through page one of the purchase and sale agreement, use your text tool at the top and say, offer not accepted. I used to say offer rejected. I was told there was a kinder, gentler way to say that. Offer not accepted and have your seller sign it in that and then just send back that page one or the whole, the whole thing, whatever, but send that back to the buyer's agents. I understand that that takes time um, that takes a lot of time if you've had 15 or 20 offers. You know what? It doesn't take more time then. But it doesn't take more time than a DOL complaint <laughs> that you have to face. Um, and I think as a professional courtesy, every one of those buyer's agents took at least an hour or two to write an offer on your listing. What is another five or 10 minutes for you to have your seller acknowledge receipt of that offer and send it back so that buyer's agent can present something to their buyer so they feel good knowing their offer was they're not going to feel good their offer wasn't accepted and it might be the 10th offer they've written that wasn't accepted but at least they can feel good knowing that the seller saw it and i think that's a minimum standard that we owe to each other as colleagues and to the consumers i agree 100 percent. okay so i think that's it for this topic okay if you have questions on timely presentation or anything else, send an email to me, legalhotline at warealtor.org. Thank you for being a Washington Realtors member. <laughs>